Great. Well, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar on corporate venture capital with Scott of Touchdown Ventures, Paul of Mach 49, and Dave, uh, CEO, investor, and author of Predicting the Turn. My name is Stu Wilson. I'm the CEO of Radical. And before I hand it off to Dave and our STEAM panelists, a bit on why we're here. Um, I believe that investing in the future has never been more important, but that doing so effectively is very hard. Uh, and with these webinars, we are sharing perspectives and best practices from those on the forefront of big company innovation. And our goal is to make navigating the future easier. Uh, who are we? Very quickly, Radical is a new market insights company uh, that helps many of the world's leading companies, customers like Nestle and Silicon Valley Bank and Bacardi, Ikea, Lego, uh, and dozens of others make faster, better informed and more confident investments in the future, whether it's launching new products and services, deciding what markets to enter or find the right startup partner. Uh, and we believe that new markets require new insights because the future is different from the present and insights on new markets are often not in consumers' heads and accessible via surveying, but in the heads of people anchored in the future, people building the future of these markets. Uh, with that being said, uh, we're excited to have Dave moderate this session with Paul and Scott. Rather than spend uh, any more time um, introducing myself or introducing them, I'll hand it over to Dave, who will kick us off and let the panelists introduce uh, themselves. Dave, this is your show. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks as always, Stu. It's a pleasure. So, you know, this is a panel I've really been looking forward to. Uh, you know, we have two amazing experts here to talk about this world of corporate venture. And since I never can do it justice, I want to start and have uh, Scott and Paul both introduce themselves, you know, briefly touch upon, uh, you know, your firms and if you can, because I think you both have such interesting models, what is unique about your approach uh, to corporate venture and just who's a couple of the firms or companies that you work with? So why don't we uh, start with Scott? Sure. I'm Scott Lynette. Nice to meet everybody. I'm a co-founder of Touchdown Ventures. We help corporations design, launch, and then run their corporate venture capital programs. We're seven years old. Uh, we have 50 professionals in the firm. Our employee number 50 just joined on Monday. And we're working with 18 different corporations. I think we're just scratching the surface of this market. And what's unique about it is that, you know, sort of we're, you know, together with Paul and his group pioneering the space. Absolutely. I would have said it exactly that way. Scott and his team really kind of invented the concept of, um, of supporting folks uh, doing CDC. We're, we're certainly sort of the, I guess, the upstart. We're uh, about three years old coming into this. Um, I spent my operating career helping to start two software companies, uh, one called Pure Software with Reed Hastings, um, and then the other with Mark Haney and Michael Horvath, better known today as Strava, um, a company called Kana Communications. I did both of those with Andy Ratcliffe, the founder of Benchmark Capital, took those public. They went to about $12 billion. And then I spent the last 20 years as a general partner at Foundation Capital, which is a very good firm here out in Silicon Valley. And uh, about two years ago, began to advise Mach 49 on this concept, probably three years ago. And, uh, and then now we find ourselves kind of in the fray. We've taken a slightly different approach than, than what Scott and the team started with. And, and that'll be one of the fun things for us to be able to talk about today. But um, we originated the concept three years ago. Um, to be blunt, uh, before COVID, I think we had four clients. Um, as of last week, we have 20. Um, so the Scott and I will be in violent agreement that this is a market that is that is just now really starting to explode. And it's interesting as we've both been traditional VCs and we've both been operators. Yeah, yeah. perfect. Well, I wanna set the stage uh, to really get going because you know some of the folks on this might not be familiar with some of the terminology that's being tossed around. You know, when we say CVC, et cetera, uh, and it's a model that's changed over the years. There's been multiple cycles of corporate venture capital. So can you start with just how each of you define what falls under the scope of corporate venture capital and why do you think it's been increasing in popularity in recent years? Go for it, Paul, and I'll jump in. So we have kind of three areas in which we've been called in to work with folks. One is, the, I would say, the traditional sort of CDC advisory. Um, what Scott and his team have done a brilliant job is is, is inventing kind of the model of outsourcing. So, you know, they'll come in, you'll give them money, they're gonna invest the money, you're gonna hear all these great reports and knowledge and insight that you're gonna learn. We took a different approach in the sense that 
Um, our original client was Bonnie Simi at JetBlue. Um, she asked Linda, our founder and CEO at Mach 49, um, and I to help her get started on what became JetBlue Technology Ventures. Uh, and then since then, we've now been effectively co-founders of TDK Ventures, uh, Printover Cards, Conviviality Ventures, Hypertherm Ventures, now working with Xerox Ventures, um, with uh, Rio Tinto, with Valley, with Tampa Bay uh, General, with Gunderson Health, and, and a whole bunch of other folks that we're working with. And we sort of see three buckets out there. One is basically taking the concepts of top tier uh, venture capital uh, and injecting them into the corporation. So what I know Scott and the team did a really good job was getting people to understand, hey, at Comcast, here's how we did it and here's how other people have done it and benchmarking that. We just didn't see a lot of room for us to improve upon that model. And instead what we're doing is I've assembled what we call our core or squad of GPs and residents. So I've got 10 of these and we deploy them across corporate America. Um, this group of 10 general partners who average 20 years of experience at top tier firms have generated over $1.5 trillion of market cap. So that's the knowledge and insight that we're trying to inject into these companies. It's the, you know, let's, let's, let's skip the phase of, hey, let's go follow, you know, so-and-so who's done something in, in CDC. Let's just go right to the practices of top tier venture that have produced the alpha returns which we believe corporations are capable of doing, but we've got to, you know, we want to be their river guides to kind of take them there. Yep, same. Um, and I think, you know, to your question about the definition of it, we, we like to distinguish between corporate venture and corporate venturing more broadly, which sound like they could be exactly the same thing, you know, but often aren't. So I would look at corporate venturing as the umbrella bucket that, you know, might be synonymous with external innovation. Um, although sometimes it could include internal innovation. You've got some patents or someone's invented something. What do we do with it as the corporation? And I think that what corporations are waking up to is the idea that if you operate in a cave and ignore what's happening in the outside world, you're probably going to get blindsided in some way. And so, you know, the idea is not everything can be invented in-house. In our opinion, corporate venture capital is the best way to stay informed and understand what's happening in the world of external innovators, meaning startups and venture capital. So corporate venture capital is having a program with capital to fund and receive fund startups and receive equity back. Venturing is you know, sort of more broadly interacting with startups, which also could be buying them when they're small. It could be doing commercial deals with them. We touch all of those things, but with the core of running investment programs. And Dave, you had asked the question, you know, sort of who are some of the recognizable companies that we work with? You know, I mentioned it's 18 today and growing. Some of the bigger names are Kellogg's. We work with T-Mobile, Avery Dennison, the material science company, Scott's Miracle Grow the Lawn and Turf Company. And there's a whole bunch of large private companies that if you're not in those industries, you probably haven't heard of. Perfect. So when you sit down to talk to a company, you know, how many of them are completely new to corporate venture capital and really need that 101 education versus their company has tried it in the past and you're actually trying to educate them on why things are different today? I think in our experience, it's a pretty equal mix. I think, you know, there's some that tried it and failed and want to try again. There's some that are brand new and they say, we want help. We want to do it right. There's some who've, you know, sort of written their first couple of checks and they said, actually, maybe this is a little bit harder <laughs> than we thought. We want to make sure all the best practices that Paul talked about are being leveraged um, and that they can fit in with the you know, sort of existing business, the way venture capital is practiced, which is really important because it is, you know, kind of an insider club. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, Scott answered that really well. It's, um, I'm, I'm gonna, I'll try to, you know, limit it to sort of three buckets of, of activity. And I'll use our clients as an example because I think that's going to be most illustrative. You know, we've got people that are existing players. So Schneider Electric, $500 million SE Ventures Fund, working with Eriberto Diarte and his team. Um, they have a different set of needs than working with, you know, some of our brand new companies that are kind of moving into the space. Um, you know, canonical example for us was when we were giving a talk at Stanford and Nicholas Savage, uh, who was at that time a senior director at TDK, had never invested, uh, came up and said, hey, I want to start TDK Corporate Ventures. That's a perfect fit for Mach 49. Because our model is not to outsource the activity. It's actually to keep the people in the seat. And then we come in and basically, in his case, he describes us as his golf teacher. In other cases, we're like the river guide. 
Um, but our goal is to grow the next generation of top tier venture capitalists, people like Nathan Pascarella at Hypertherm and, and uh, you know, Nicolas Savage at TDK and Stefan Longuet at Conviviality at Pernod Ricard, Abhijit Ganguly at Goodyear, um, you know, Chris Fisher and team at, at Xerox. I and mean, these are people that we think are, you know, and know that they have all the intellect necessary to be able to do this. They just didn't, they didn't fall off the turnip truck from Virginia like I did and show up in Silicon Valley and 23 years old and then meet Reed Hastings in a hot tub, right? That doesn't happen to everybody. And so it didn't happen to those people, but they have the intellect, the drive and the ambition to learn how to be, you know, some of the top venture capitalists in the world. And so that's what, that's what we spend our time trying to do is to get them into a position to where it's about them. And then all that knowledge and insight stays inside the company and then sort of, you know, like kind of waterfalls down into the rest of the organization. And I think with the comment Scott made earlier is perfect, which is that we think this external, you know, engine of CBC is really the, it's actually not only the best, but it's the most efficient way to get knowledge and insight. You can be out making $2 million, $3 million investments in companies. And then that company turns out to be Tesla or in the case of Goodyear, too simple, right? You know, comes in at 2 billion sitting at 10 or 12 today. That's in nine months, right? So these are the things that, that are possible out there if people will dedicate themselves and their time and their energy to do it. I'll make one other kind of qualifying point I should have made up earlier, but um, you know, Scott and his team are, are super dedicated to this. And as I said, really the founders and originators of this concept. Um, Mod 49 has really two elements of what we do. We call it disrupting outside in, which is all the stuff we're talking about now. But disrupting inside out is an even bigger business for us. And that's helping to launch and incubate new companies inside the corpus of some of the largest companies in the world. Shell, Stanley Black & Decker, Hitachi, Intel, and many others. By the end of last year, we've launched 40 new companies inside these organizations. So we, Linda Yates, our founder and CEO, describes it as kind of the yin and yang of each other. And so many of our clients work with this on both dimensions. They want to build an incubator and so forth. And that part of our practice is being chronicled in the next big strategy book coming out from Harvard called The Unicorn Within by Linda Yates, founder and CEO. So that's all about that disrupting inside out part of it. And then today we're, we're digging deep on the outside in. Paul, the question is, do you still have the turnips? Do I have the turnips? The turnips are probably embedded in my in behind my ears, basically. But yeah. Well, the only other caveat that I want to add, because I really like the comments you made about the people development side with the, you know, your corporate partners, we have the same exact mentality. And so, you know, from a distance, I think touchdown does look a lot like outsourcing, but think of us really as the co-GP with these corporations where we will staff a team, the, you know, the way Paul described, but also working together with in-house counterparts. So, you know, just like, you know, you routed off that list of folks, I would say the same thing about, you know, all of our corporate partners, they have, you know, people with great intellect and drive who are, you know, leaders inside their organizations. And part of why they decide to work with us is the same as what you just said. You know, they believe they can do it. They want to, they want to, you know, I, I like River Guide as a way to describe it. And, you know, we're on that trip with them. So as we were preparing for this, uh, you know, discussion, we asked kind of the panel, you know, the, the group and the attendees, what do they want to learn? And they want to get down to the brass tacks, you know, really understand some of these more common questions that they find themselves talking to their corporations about. So to shift into that, you know, let's start with structure. You know, one of the first things that seems to come up is, do I need to raise a fund like a traditional venture capital would, or should we be investing off the balance sheet? How do you guide companies through that choice as a starting point? Now, I'll go first here. When we started working with Nicola, he, he really went for the full Monty. He went to Tokyo. He asked for $50 million. He asked it to be set up as a set of subsidiary. So one of the things I think is so cool about the TDK story, you know, which got chronicled in Forbes, so that was nice for us, but is that Nicola went from being a senior director, one of probably 300, to being one of the nine presidents at TDK. All right, so he's president of TDK Ventures. $50 million separate kind of bank account, as it were, right? So it's not something that if they have a tough quarter, it gets pulled back and things like that, which has historically been a challenge for CDC. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter as long as there's kind of commitment and as long as there's the notion that, okay, you know, so Goodyear announced they're going to do a $100 million fund. Xerox has announced $250 million fund. Schneider's got the $500 million. But we work with the guys at, at Hypertherm, $30, $35 million fund. It doesn't matter at the, at the end of the day because you can fit the corporate strategy with the CBC strategy and deliver the strategic goals 
And ideally, if you're doing it really well, you're also going to deliver the financial goals from that perspective. So the structure is fungible. The structure is flexible. You can kind of make any of that stuff work, which doesn't work as well. And I'll turn it over to Scott here. Um, and and it is, is the, you know, we're kind of on again, off again. Like, you know, this quarter we feel good. We're going to allocate some stuff. Next quarter, not so much. Um, we cannot afford to take on people in those kind of relationships because what we're leveraging are my, you know, 20 plus years president of the Western Association of Venture Capital. If we need to go see Scott Sandell at NEA, we'll go over, we'll sit down with him, we'll have a conversation. I can't do that with somebody who next quarter they're going to change their mind. Um, that's not fair to any of our contacts, not fair to me. And frankly, it's not even fair to the company that's doing it. So we, and I'm sure Scott, drill into people, you know, you got to have a level of commitment here. If you're not going to have a certain level of commitment, then let's just not do that right now. Let's just, let's take another year and think about it. Let's work with you on strategic partnering, work with you on some M&A strategy, things like that instead. Yeah, that, uh, Paul, I think that taps into probably one of the greatest fears that traditional VCs and entrepreneurs have about corporate VCs is, are you going to be there when I need you? Right. If the answer is, I don't know, they don't want your money, right? So, uh, you know, I think a traditional fund structure is good when you're trying to signal to VCs that you're going to act just like them. But what's more important is that you really do act just like them. And so, you know, sort of when the rubber hits the road and the next round of funding is happening and insiders all have to pony up, do you deliberate the same way? Do you decide to support the company with rational metrics? Are you acting like a VC would? And then they like you as a partner. And if you're flaky or you don't communicate well, then they're not going to like you and you're not going to get invited back into the next round. So I think ultimately behavior matters. On the structural question, Dave, what I think actually matters a little bit more isn't what legal form you pick or what kind of entity from the balance sheet or dedicated fund, but um, what's the source of the funding? And so, you know, we've worked with where it's the corporate, you know, sort of balance sheet or, you know, comes from the, you know, general ledger versus where it maybe comes from a specific business unit. And I think one of the dangers is if it comes from a very specific PL operator, that may lead to alignment problems. It may lead to incentive problems. Because what I've sometimes heard CFOs say is, well, how do I punish the PL operator when they've lost the money? And when that loss, when that write-off, you know, write-off shows up on the on the balance sheet of that PL operator and it hits the earnings, they may get very conservative in a way that doesn't match up with venture capital. So making sure that the source of funding is aligned with the level of risk that the corporation wants to take is maybe more important than the corporate form. And I, I see there's a question, we should probably both handle it, Paul, from Brian, about whether or aware of any corporates that have created a fund with outside LPs. I am aware. Um, it's certainly, it seems to be the exception. It's probably more common in my experience with some of the Japanese conglomerates. Um, and, you know, there's pros and cons. Obviously the pro is you get leverage on your capital. And the con is now you're responsible for somebody else's money and you may not be able to pursue all your strategic objectives with full flexibility. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, so we, we gave a talk this morning on GCDI about the importance of moving towards more traditional venture models for CDC. So to, the talk this morning was, you know, are you receiving carry? And if you're not, you should be. And here's why. Right. Yeah. So. Um, to that end, if I look at what's happening, we've, we've created a construct where we, we look at what we call kind of four phases of CDC. Phase one is kind of the getting started, right? First phase, typically just regular corporate compensation, salary bonus, things like that, not related to performance of the fund. Phase two is some element of performance of the fund starts to impact compensation. Maybe the notion of shadow carry, if not even, you know, kind of more significant bonuses where it might happen to be. And the, and the education of the company as to why that becomes important. Phase three, you begin to move into a model where people begin to contemplate and start to execute on multiple LPs. Um, it may still be a core anchor LP, but there will be some others that will come in, perhaps synergistic to the strategy of the company, where it might happen to be. And then phase four, and, and a lot of this is driven by compensation, <laughs> phase four is the breakout, right? So that's what, what we now see with Siemens Ventures, which is not Siemens Ventures anymore. It's Next 47. Scott knows all this stuff. But, you know, with Sa uh, SAP Ventures, well, now it's Sapphire. Those guys, their compensation models are more or less identical to the compensation models at the top tier firms out there. Some are two and 20, some are two and a half, 25, some are three and 30 in the case of, you know, the benchmarks and supporters of the world. But getting into the those models allows that 
kind of graduated group of CBCs, for lack of a better way to describe it, are now competing head to head for talent deals and compensation and outcomes. And the impacts are very, very dramatic. And, and Scott knows this, but if you were coming in as a CBC and you're sitting in a boardroom with other people who are general partners at some top tier firms, your compensation is anywhere from one tenth to one thirtieth of the people sitting around the table. And we are gonna try to help fix that for the CBC world. Yeah, we're very passionate about the idea that you, know, you create alignment through compensation. And it's a challenging topic inside a corporate environment, you know, with the exception of salespeople, they're, you know, generally not accustomed to those forms of compensation, but there are analogies and there are ways to break down those barriers. So let's get in a little bit more on that one, because both of you mentioned this tension that exists of the financial versus the strategic. And with what Paul just outlined, you know, when you get to that fourth phase, it's for the financial and the alignment and everything else, which maybe took you away from the strategic of originally why things were started. So how should a corporation think about the tensions between financials versus strategic and also the natural evolution of where CBC is going to go over the lifetime of an effort? So I, I think that's terrible. So, <laughs> you know, if you saw the movie Sophie's Choice, it's like you don't want to have to make the choice. And I think it's a false, you know, spectrum to say you have to pick one or the other. I think the job of a CVC is you maximize both. And if it's a bad financial investment, don't invest. Do something else. Do a commercial deal. Go buy the startup. You know, be friends with them and learn from them. But don't put, equi don't put dollars at risk in equity with a thesis that says we're not actually going to make money here. No entrepreneur is going to respect that. No traditional VC is going to want to work with you. That's how you're going to get the label of dumb money that, you know, haunted CVCs for several decades that I think we're climbing out of now. Similarly, if it's financial only, you know, maybe the family that owns the corporation should be putting their personal money into it. But what does it have to do with your corporation? So if there's no strategic angle of any kind, you know, if it's material science company Avery Dennison and someone has the best new form of hot dog stand, we're just like, they have nothing to do with each other. We're not going to fund that. There has to be something where you say, why is this corporation belong on the cap table of the startup? And what can we do to help make that startup sing? What can we help do to make them better? And in return, what can that equity relationship with the startup do to make our business better? Whether it's getting into a new business that we're not in, defending a multi-billion dollar line of business that you know we already control, you know, reinforcing our leadership position, watching out for disruptive trends for the future. All of those are very legitimate reasons that have strategic relevance. But if there's no relevance, it's just a financial only investment. And then you're not a CBC, you're just a VC. Yeah, and I think, I mean, a, a perfect set of comments, like nothing, nothing to quibble with there. Um, maybe because I'm, I'm coming off of, you know, 18 years as a GP at a, at a, at a known firm, I get asked variations of this question kind of all the time. Um, and so I, I actually put together like a chart. We don't have time to show it today, but I'll, I'm going to air chart it for you now. So four quadrants, like upper right, traditional VC. And then the upper, upper right of that are the elites, you know, the Sequoias and the benchmarks and the XLs and so forth, right? So what do they do? They focus on making money in anything they find, okay? So like they're agnostic to the domain, making money, right? Big dollar signs, right? That some of the most efficient individual investors in the world outside of PE are you going to see an early stage venture in that quadrant. Over on the left side, you're going to see corporate venture, anywhere from folks that have, you know, very kind of vanilla corporate approaches all the way to the next 47s and the SAPs, right? They're, you know, the Sapphires, they're coming up and starting to cross over into the border of that other space. Now, when they begin, they're domain specific and they're trying to make money, but they're domain specific and really tied to strategy. As they get through that fifth, fourth phase, now they're entering into the world of financial venture. They're starting to do social networks and they used to be an electronics company, right? They're starting to do things to make money as it were. The other two quadrant aren't quite as important for this discussion. The lower right is sort of the Chan Zuckerbergs and the breakthroughs, the kind of the family offices do good by you know helping make money for things that do good. The lower left is important to note because that's the old world of corporate venture. That's the hardcore strategic focus. Maybe we make money, maybe we don't make money. We mostly don't make money, right? And when you don't make money, it's not perceived to be successful. And exactly what Scott indicated, 
comes comes to the fore. So it, somewhere in there, you have to create your balance and your construct. But but so far in twenty client relationships, strategy and financial return they factor in in every single case. Like there's no one that's abandoning one for the other. But but it's I think it's really important to understand that construct and understand the motivation. Because for many of our clients, they're getting some of their very best deals are ones that we're walking them into that are coming from the top tier venture apparatus where they've got, you know, 20 people digging deals, scout networks, micro funds are invested. I mean, they're working at a level of sophistication that the vast majority of CBCs can't really approach. And so when you get into that world, we need people to really understand what that world's about and what motivates people there, because that's what's going to make them successful in the longer term as partners with those kind of people, which is very, very important. I like that. We, uh, we need to get that and send that to everyone here as a, uh, a follow-up afterwards. So it'll be a great one to look at. So when you think about these other, you know, different things, you mentioned, you know, all the different things that can come in strategy, you know, buy something, you know, invest because you want to see what's coming in the future, et cetera. You, you hear this thing come up a lot, especially from entrepreneurs and startups of, well, you know, do you want to take money from somebody that's going to buy you one day because they might see too much? How do you think about that strategic, tr strategic angle of understanding an industry, but also maybe investing in somebody that's directly competing with you? Yeah, I think you have to be really careful about that, both as an entrepreneur and as the corporate who's considering making the investment. Uh, they're, you know, programs that are completely dedicated to path to control investments where, you know, we think we're going to buy it in the future and that's why we're doing the deal. Mm -hmm. Daniel Grubbs at Pepsi has done a really nice job with that, starting with Kavita, the kombucha company, which was their first investment. And that became the blueprint for, you know, what they were going to do. And I think it will evolve, but the notion was we're going to invest and we're going to talk about the fact that you're going to want us to buy you at some point and that's the goal. And, and there's great communication that that is the premise for the investment. I think where you, you know, kind of run afoul of the rules of the game is, well, we think we might want to buy you and we're going to try to sneak some things in there. And as soon as traditional VCs and entrepreneurs think that their return is capped, you're dead. Um, that is, you know, death to reputation. So what I think Daniel and his team have done well is to say, we're going to architect this in a way where it's above board and everybody knows they're going to make plenty of money if this works. And you're all going to be happy with the financial return in the IRR. I think that's successful. When I think if the entrepreneur is not saying, I, you know, I want you to own us down the road and let's figure out a way to get to that as success for all of us, you can't push it too hard. And I think that when CVCs come in and say, you know, we want a you know, right to acquire you, I, we, we advise never doing that type of thing. So I think extreme caution is required. You know. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it, that's the old way. And, and, you know, that's, that's why, you know, we have a whole module that we talk about, which is managing the mothership, right? So over the last, and I'm not saying this to be braggy, it's just simply the way it is. Scott will agree with this because now all of a sudden this little sleepy sector is the top of the board book, right? You know, it's the first page. Um, and so over the last uh, 12 months, Linda and I, the founder of Mach 49, have met face-to-face -face slash face-to-face -face on Zoom most of the time with nine Fortune 500 CEOs, All right? So Alex Ricard at Pernod Ricard, Jim Laurie at Stanley Black & Decker, Jeff Peterson at Halliburton, uh, Lorenzo at, at Baker Hughes, um, CEO at ADECO, right? Um, uh, George Oliver at Johnson Controls. Like these, all of this stuff that Scott referred to earlier around sort of external innovation, outside in innovation, all this stuff has bubbled to the top of the board book because... And it's really the founding reason for Mach 49 is to allow large companies not to get Kodak. And, and CBC is a way to be, it's a tool, it's a weapon, it's, a, it's an arrow in your quiver, but it's not the only arrow, right? You can do incubation, you can do all this internal generation of companies, you can do M&A work, you can do strategic partnerships. These are all the places that you can kind of, you know, come to play from that perspective. But, you know, you need to kind of be aggressive and you need to kind of have your eyes open about what it is you want to pursue. Uh, but you, you got to go hard at it because time's a waste. And, and Paul, I think that um, there's a question in the chat that the last thing you said actually reminded me of. Um, you know, Brian asked this question, does CBCs die 
because they're strategic only or because they're trying to be financial but incompetent at it. And I actually think that last thing that you said is know why you're doing it is the bigger reason. So uh, our experience is that a lot of folks we've met, they didn't figure out what their goals were and they didn't tie why the CBC program was important to the overall objectives of the corporation. So a huge part of our process, and I know it is you know, for you too, when we come in, we have the C-suite articulate the most important goals. And we make sure that the design of the venture capital program supports those goals. Because if you're off doing deals and they're just deals for deal's sake, why do you have it? That's definitely not strategic. But if you can say, you know, the CEO has published this goal. These are key metrics. We're all trying to make sure these happen. So we all keep our jobs and the corporation survives. Then the venture program actually matters. And so that tie to strategy is what's special about corporate venture capital. And I think that's the, that's the main reason that a lot of these programs die too early is it's just too disconnected from what's important. And I'd say too, I'm sorry, Dave, let us run, run with this a little bit, but we've got, yeah, we've got, we've got the ham and egg working now. Um, the other aspect of this about being at the top of the board book. So, so one of the things that, that we've seen is once we start to engage with um, at, you know, at a senior level, when, when we're doing the kind of things we're doing across the board, um, we're, you know, we have quite a substantial relationship with these companies. That's one of the reasons we end up with the CEO. But well, I would say that on average, the CEOs of our client companies have tripled the amount of time they're spending in the Silicon Valley since they began to associate with us. And so, for example, I'll give you like a, a just a very current snapshot of that. Uh, Rich Kramer, CEO of Goodyear, um, two weeks ago, I'm pointing out here, two weeks ago, out on the patio, we put together a dinner. Uh, we had 12 GPs from really good firms show up, founding investors in Tesla, SpaceX, Slack, Peloton, a bunch of other companies, right? Sitting, sitting with Rich, you know, we start the dinner at seven. I literally had to kick people out of the house at 11 o'clock at night. And now that's now turning into a much bigger, broader set of relationships are going to come out of that. And, and my, and I, you know, I have a bias here, but I bet you Scott shares the bias. These CEOs and boards and C-suites, they've got to get woke, right? Not woke on social causes. They got to get woke about the impact of what venture can do for them from a strategy perspective and what can do for results. Linda's got this great line that's in her book, The Unicorn Within. We're going to help you move from being a value stock to a growth stock. This is, again, one of the errors in the quiver to allow these companies to do this, to move to a much stronger growth profile, which they've been fighting and fighting and fighting to do, but we offer an accelerant for them. What Scott does, what we do, it's an accelerant that allows them to get going faster and show more results early in the process. So let's dive into that one a little bit more, that you mentioned the relationship piece of that, and that you know this is a world where networks matter and connections matter. A lot of corporate venture, it's this debate of how do we bring in partners? How do we use our internal employees? Do we bring in somebody that actually comes from venture capital that understands it? What advice do you give on that model to start thinking about the team that is required to really build a great corporate venture capital group? So I'll start with that one because it's a it's a really key tenet of, of, of why we are in the business, basically. So you know, we have a pretty strong bias that we want to develop people internally. And one of the reasons that we want to do that is that they know where the antibodies are. They know where the resistance points are. They also know where the key stars are within the corporation. And, and as Scott will tell you, that's a key success factor for these funds is to deliver the value add, right? We have a whole slide that says, look, the Silicon Valley doesn't need your money. What does it need? It needs customer relationships. It needs your expertise. It needs your operating experience and so forth. So, that's one of the key things that we kind of drive for in terms of working with these companies. And the best way that we found so far is to find that Dave Knox or Scott Leonard or Paul Holland, who's inside that corporation and grow them up and get them into a position where they're now on the stars list at GCB and all these other things. But more importantly, they've got this, this breadth and this visibility in this network. I mean, with using Nicola as an example, and I'll put the Forbes piece in the chat just so that people can get a flavor for that. When we began working with him, I don't, I don't think he knew anybody in venture capital. Well, now he knows 250 people, right? So, and, and he networks with them, he co-invests with them. They rely upon some of the things that we've worked with, with TDK to deliver in terms of value add. They open up their R&D team, they open up their sensor team, their battery team, so the largest provider of lithium ion consumer batteries in the world. Like these are all super hot topical things that GPs at top firms 
and that startup CEOs, they want to get some of that, right? But they didn't know it because the world just wasn't oriented that way. Back in the day, you know, like maybe the CEO heard about the CDC, like, you know, around the corner somehow, but had almost nothing to do with it. Now we're moving down a path where boards, executives, and C-suites, they have to be engaged around this. If they don't, um, you know, get serious about understanding the power of the venture model and what can it mean for that corporation, then they're just going to get left behind. It's just that simple. The thing that I, you know, I certainly agree with everything that Paul just said. Um, if you can't reach into the organization and leverage the relationships and knowledge and skills, it's just not going to deliver benefit to the startups and to the marketplace. So it's a, it's a required ingredient for this to be successful. I think the part of our experience that maybe is additive to those comments is that the number one determinant of longevity of the program is do the people involved have prior venture capital experience? And obviously, you know, Paul, you have a wealth of prior venture capital experience as being on these teams to help make sure that the deals are actually good deals. And, you know, that I think that's why both of our companies exist is if you go it completely alone, you're rolling the dice. And yeah. if you have someone who's never done a venture capital deal, the chances that you're going to get the terms wrong or get taken advantage of are high. There's, you know, probably a hundred new CBC started every year. So only a fraction of them are deciding to work with an external partner, you know, like a touchdown or a Mach 49. So there are plenty who are saying, hey, I'm going to take my chances or they're going to go hire somebody, you know, who has prior experience. But for those who say, I want to go faster and I want a guide to help me with it and I want someone to help me develop my internal, you know, people, you know, you have two slightly different flavors of it between our firms, you know, one that's, you know, probably slightly more hands-on in the touchdown approach you know, and another that's obviously working very well at Mach 49 too. And I, I'd, I'd say just to put an exclamation point on that, we were approached by a firm that, of course, a, a company that shall be unnamed, um, when I, they had been at it by themselves. Um, and you know, obviously what Scott and I are saying are com is completely self-serving. Okay, so like, let's, let's just kind of put it out there as a caveat. However, it's also true, right? So, I mean, you know, Scott and the team, they, they've got different models. They'll, they'll kind of build a fund for you. They've got a, you know, compensation model, some, sometimes two and 20, sometimes other things that they do. They've got a different approach. We do, basically, it's a fee-for-service advisory. We're there to just simply inject the knowledge, be in the partner meetings, help provide the guardrails, help provide the deal flow, the relationships, all this other stuff. And then over time, if you don't need us anymore, it's fine. Like, it's no harm, no foul. That's awesome. Like, we're, we're here because we think, 10,000 companies out there really should be doing this. And we want all of them to do it well. And Scott and I will be in violent agreement on that. But we were approached by one company. And I just remember how sad this poor person was who came and talked to us. And I said, well, you know, how long have you guys been at this? And they said, well, we've been doing it ourselves for three years. Um, and I said, okay, well, let me see your portfolio. And they showed me their portfolio. And it was, I mean, this is a morbid reference, but it was like going into the morgue and open up the drawer and look at the toe tag, oh, electrocution, close that one, you know, oh death by fire, you know, you know, plague, right? It was just the world's worst portfolio. And I said, what is your process? How, is, how did you guys set this up? And they said, well, we have 12 lines of business. We have to write a 45 page report for every one of our investments. And we have to give the heads of 12 lines of business 60 days to comment on the report. And, and I said, okay, well then you have just designed the system that, that is the best example of adverse selection and deal flow in the history of mankind. Like you've got to blow this thing up and you got to start over or 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 just keep going and, and good luck to you from that perspective. Yeah, the arrow, the arrow went exactly where you aimed it. Yeah, there you go. Right, precisely. Yeah. So take that a little bit step further and let's talk about geography. Um, you know, as you mentioned, what's vitally important is that connection to the company and all the value that goes there. Last I checked, I think 40 of the states uh, in the U.S. have Fortune 500 headquarters, but venture capital is still a pretty, you know, concentrated effort in a few different cities. How do you think about that tension of the, the geography of the CVC teams and the connection to the headquarters versus connection to the networks and the deals? Go ahead, Scott. I, I mean, I think the last year and a half has changed that a lot. I mean, it was already changing. Um, you know, we used to joke around when I lived in Silicon Valley, you know, if you can't get there on a tank of gas and a Ferrari, don't go, which I guess today's joke would be, you know, on a single charge in a Tesla. 
um, when I moved from the Bay Area to Sacramento to start the DFJ Frontier Fund with, you know, Tim Draper and the, the rest of the crew there, you know, they said, Sacramento, oh my God, it's so far away. It's like, you know, I was going to Siberia. And, you know, now I don't think anybody cares. If the deal is good, people are conducting diligence over Zoom. They're figuring out, you know, partnerships globally. They want to invest in best of breed startups. You know, some of our corporate partners we work with in seven time zones around the world. And, you know, the bigger challenge is, how do I make sure I'm awake at the right hours to have those conversations and still maintain some semblance of a home life? You know, that's a, that's a bigger issue than can, can we work without, you know, funding companies that are all in Silicon Valley. And I think we've seen that great companies can be born anywhere in the world. Um, you know, different states and, you know, geographies create different incentives for entrepreneurs, but I think that will continue and will accelerate and people will live where they want to go live. Yeah, and I think here's the here's the exclamation point I can put on that. You know, we have 20 active clients as of the end of last week. One of those 20 is in the Silicon Valley. Um, the other 19 are, gosh, I haven't counted the time zones, but it's a lot. <laughs> so it's it's every continent but Antarctica uh, where we're working with people now. And and so what we do is we provide one, we provide the arms and legs on the ground in the Silicon Valley, and also Boston, Singapore. Amsterdam, London, the places where Mach 49, so Mach 49 has 110 people around the world. So we have people all over the place, plus our network of people. Back in the day when I was at Foundation, I founded something called the, the what is now the FC Fellows Program. So for 10 years, I had really talented grad students act as scouts for Foundation Capital. Now those that's 100 kids. Those 100 kids are now, probably 25 of them are full-time in venture capital now, partners at Accel, crew ventures, started their own firms and things like that. Those are all part of what we call MockNet. It's the extended network of people that we'll try to tap into from that perspective. But they look at us as being sort of their arms and legs and a brain on the ground in the Silicon Valley so that they don't have to open up a, an office or that they can delay the timing to be able to open it. And I agree with Scott, COVID has accelerated all of those things. Everybody that thought everything had to be in person, obviously they've all been proven wrong. And so now we're in a situation where like, well, where do we go from here? There's an unintended consequence slash benefit of our model that I didn't understand when we first started doing it because Bonnie Simi was our first kind of like demonstration client and she's a friend and she's here in the Silicon Valley and so forth. Um, but when we started to work with people like, you know, Nathan Pascarella at, and, and Aaron Brandt at Hypertherm, we start working with Aaron Spring and Abhijit Ganguly at, at Goodyear. What we're doing is we're, we're taking 180 years of knowledge from general partners of top tier firms and we're pouring it into Akron, Ohio. We're pouring it into Hanover, New Hampshire. We're pouring it into Tel Aviv. We're pouring it into Amsterdam, in Paris, in London. We're pouring it into Singapore. We're pouring it into Tokyo, right? So, and, and I know this is going to sound kind of like whatever, you know, a little bit Pollyannish, but it's working, right? These are, I mean, Abhijit and, and, and Aaron in, in Goodyear, we're actually having dinner with them tonight in San Francisco. They're super smart people. They want to build a world-class venture capital fund, not a corporate venture capital fund. They want a world-class world venture fund. And so they're willing to do the work and, and, and take the lessons and apply them and things like that. So because of COVID, I would say it's accelerated this model by 10x. It's allowing people to be super effective. It's allowing... Good year to get into too simple and have this huge win in nine months, right? That that many people two years ago would have said that's not possible. You have to have your partner meetings. You've got to go to Akron, or they've got to come here, and you do know, all this other stuff. And now we we know that that's all bullshit, right? It's all just like get the work done. You can form the relationships, get the work done, and do the work. Provide the value add to the general partners at the top firms, and to the founders and the CEOs, and to your partners in corporate venture. If you do that, you can do it from wherever you want. You can do it in your pajamas, your Lululemon pants, doesn't matter, right? Go for it. We do, we do have a joke about which person in our firm is always wearing sweatpants. <laughs> I won't say who it is. <laughs> Fair enough. So we've got a couple minutes left. You know, reminder to everybody, please throw in some questions. We'll save a couple at the end. Uh, so we've got a lot from Brian. Let's see some other folks uh, throw some questions in there. Uh, but I want to end with some talks on the organizational structure. Um, you know, Paul, you mentioned that with TDK, Nicholas became the ninth president for that business. So when you think about CVC, who should it report into? And how should you think about the best practices when it comes to just 
building the organizational structure in that regard? So I think, I think you have to be careful here, but I think there's, there's some very good answers. It doesn't always have to be the CEO, right? Because CEO is super busy. Um, you know, ideally, you want to have the CEO informed. It, it'd be great if he's on the investment committee or she's on the investment committee, but actually that, that's not even required anyway. I'll use uh, Stefan Langay at Pernod Ricard, right? So Pernod Ricard, Absolute Vodka, Jameson, Whiskey, Mum Champagne. We co-founded Conviviality Ventures with them three years ago, right? Uh, now $150 million fund, multiple unicorns, really, really cool stuff that, that they've got going on. Well, uh, Stefan doesn't report to Alex. He reports to Christian. Christian runs all the brands. He's, I, I, don't, I don't know if I say he's the number two guy in the company. To me, he looks like the number two guy in the company. Um, but Christian's on the investment committee. Alex Ricard's on the investment committee. CFO's on the investment committee. And more importantly, Stefan Longay, managing director of the CBC, is on the investment committee. So that is a very high performing investment committee. They're very knowledgeable about our deal flow. They stay current in terms of what's going on. We don't have to re-explain everything. They're not like, you know, on their phones and doing other stuff. They're like really focused and they're, and they're getting good work done. And, and so I think there's room for different models and different ways for the reporting to work. But, but there's a concept and Nicola Savage captured this perfectly. He's done, doing a series of blog posts around, around what he calls the unlearning. What he had to unlearn from being a corporate executive to now being a, a top tier venture capitalist. And, and part of it is, and we really like to see this happen. Sometimes it happens early, other times it happens later, sometimes it doesn't happen at all. We like to get people to think about their CDC as being somewhat loosely tethered to the organization, right? Having some flexibility, having the ability to make some decisions on their own. You know, one of the cool things we're doing with Conviviality is we're mimicking what we're seeing out of top tier venture right now. One of the things that say Foundation Capital has a, a, a dedicated partner who manages microfund investments, right? It's, a, it's an acknowledgement of even some of the best venture capitalists in the world. They can't track all the deal flow. I mean, the venture industry has grown by 100x since I made the movie Something Ventured, right? So, so they, it's a recognition of that. And so the CBCs have to begin to kind of copy and, and be able to kind of get that knowledge and insight. So these are some of the things that, that have to be developed and, and having a loosely tethered relationship, um, obviously for reporting wise and financially and all that stuff, it's normal, but like having some independence, having some autonomy is actually a key success factor to becoming world-class in a CDC. Paul, I don't know if you and I ever talked about this, but Something Ventured was the name of my column in the Sacramento Business Journal. Oh, no way. Oh, no, that's too funny. Great. So yeah. when I saw your movie, I was really excited. Well, I, 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 I voted against something ventured. I, I, so I, I, I surveyed all of our friends, you know, Reed Hastings and all the guys at the Wayback Board and Sonia Hoel, who was helping me at Menlo and so forth. And I said, um, I wanted to call it the men who invented the future. Um, for well, I, I know what Sonia said to that. <laughs> yeah. No, actually, she was cool with that. She's not, you know, that's not her thing. So I wanted to call it that. Our working title was More Than Money. And then somebody said, how about something ventured? And we right. put it out on a poll and everybody said that works. And so that's how we ended up with something ventured, which is now in the Smithsonian. I'm amazing. Like our cool. Timing ended up being perfect. So, so I, I, you know, I agree with Paul that there's a lot of different options for reporting and structuring. I do tend to like CEO, CFO, head of corporate development. Mm -hmm. I think the main thing is it has to be important to the organization. So, you know, who's on the investment committee matters. I think the size of the investment committee, uh, you know, which is, an, I know, another thing you wanted to talk about, Dave, it needs to be tight. Um, it needs to be able to meet. They need to be paying attention, like Paul said, not distracted with checking their phones. And every person on the investment committee needs to have a fiduciary mindset and to be able to understand the financial investment. So often we see a lot of times where people have an instinct to say, well, let's take this one p &L operator who has a narrow expertise and put them on the IC or take a scientist and put them on the IC. I think those people should be special guest stars where they're brought in when the deal is relevant, but every single person should be able to vote intelligently on every single deal to say, is this a good investment that is also relevant to our organization? And if the CEO is not involved, if the CEO doesn't care, your chances that the whole program gets canceled just went way up and you don't want that. And, 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 the, and the thing I know Scott will agree with is if the CEO can't be involved, then figure out a role for him or her that has her connected, but not on the, on, on the critical path, right? right? Because it's death if you're sitting around, you know, we just, Scott just walked you into Tesla five years ago 
we're ready to write the $5 million check that's going to turn into $200 million. But, well, we can't. The, the CEO, he's too busy, right? So we can't get his signature. We can't do this. We can't do that. We, we unwind that from the beginning. And this is where, you know, Scott's got the gravitas from all the stuff he's done. Lynn and I walk in, our other partners, Bill Kingsley, 20 plus years, GP in, in Intertech and so forth. And we gently but firmly describe to the boards and the CEOs who quite frankly are our peers. And we explain to them, that's not the right way to do it. And you can choose to do it that way. And that may be the thing that feels more comfortable from you, the way you operate today from a culture perspective. But it's like learning a new sport or a new skill. You've got to stretch yourself. You've got to get out here. You've got to trust us, right? We're not, nobody's trying to rip you off. We just want to be the best in the world at what we do in our sector. Give us the opportunity to do that. It's like going to a foreign country and the customs are different and you need to, you know, sort of when in Rome, do it the way that they do it there. And so you need to be able to make, and does that mean you make decisions, you know, in a single day when a deal comes in? No. You know, you need to be able to do your work and enforce discipline, but you can't, this, you know, thing you described of 60 days and 12 people signing off from different, I mean, it doesn't work. Waste of time. Yeah. So we've got a minute left here with the, the webinar. So each of you had asked kind of a final thought, you know, that you want to leave somebody in the audience thinking about the world of CVC for their corporation. What do you want them to know before they pick up the, the phone to call uh, Touchdown and to call Mach 49? I mean, I would say, you, you know, you absolutely need to do this, whether you do it with a partner like us or you do it on your own. Corporations need innovation. You need to know what's going on in the world of startups. The startups are hungry to partner with you and there can be mutual value. And the entire premise of, you know, Silicon Valley or, you know, the venture capital community is that big companies and startups don't have to destroy each other. We can actually work together, disrupt markets, build more value, and that they're good at different things. So what you're good at and what the startups are good at can really coexist if you follow the best practices and do it the right way. And I'd add to that, um, think about yourself, right? And, and really do self-awareness and self-identification. If I look at what Nicolo's done, what Nathan's done, what Stefan has done, they have thrown themselves, Ronnie Lott used to have this expression of the 49ers called selling out. Like they've sold out, they've thrown their body into the fray. They're leaving their feet to make the tackle. You have to kind of have that notion in your heart that this is what you want to do. I'd say it in a different way, which is that you're probably already a high achiever in your corporation. Your, your company can spend $100,000 to send you to Stanford for six weeks, and it's going to be amazing, or Harvard, or whatever it might happen to be. Um, I, have your company, let one of us train you how to become a world-class venture capitalist, right? That's a skill that's going to be phenomenal for you. But more importantly, it's going to be phenomenal for your organization. You may be the single individual person that will make the biggest financial impact in your company. And it almost doesn't matter the size or scale of the company, because if you hit it in venture capital, you're creating nearly pure profit. And when that profit hits the bottom line, you, the CEO, loves you. And so let's work with you to, to get you in a position to have that happen. Awesome. Well, gentlemen, I can't thank you enough for taking the time. This is a uh a class and a discussion that could have gone on for many, many, many more hours. So thank you for taking the time. It's always a pleasure to learn. And I'll bring Stu back to the stage to close us out. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Paul. Uh, that was quite uh, enjoyable, uh, educational. I uh, hope the audience got as much value out of it as I did. We will follow up with all registrants um, sharing a recording of the webinar, uh, summary of key points, um, and uh, other collateral that we think could be valuable in making a decision about how to engage with corporate venture capital. So uh, thank you again to the panelists. Thank you to all the attendees and registrants and have a great afternoon. Always Thanks, good to see you guys. Good to see you again, Scott. Thanks, Dave. Yeah. Take care. See ya.